Welcome to Oak Forest United Methodist Church as we continue to worship online. We have returned in the sanctuary recording. However, we are still taking a couple more weeks to see those numbers come down. And we'll have a meeting on Sunday, February 13th, as a leadership team to go over the progress in the next couple weeks. And hopefully we'll be praying that we'll return back into the sanctuary in mid-February. So let us go ahead and prepare our hearts as we worship God. Allow God to enter these spaces wherever we are, here in the sanctuary or there in your home or your office, or maybe you're just listening in the car as you drive. Wherever we are, may God be with us. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, come and flood this space. Allow us to concentrate on you and allow us to fill your presence wherever we are. May we worship you today. Amen.
I have a question that I want you to think about for a second. Have you ever been playing a board game or a video game and you were doing really well, but suddenly you started losing? When this happens, do you wanna quit and walk away? I know that I felt that way before, but usually after I walk away from something, I want to come back and finish what I was doing. In today's Bible story, we find out that Jesus could feel that way too. We hear a lot about Jesus teaching the people around him and those people being happy to learn from Jesus. Like we learned last week, Jesus was asked to teach at the temple and at first people were happy to hear what he was saying. But as Jesus kept teaching, the people stopped liking what they were hearing. The people were not nice to Jesus because they did not like what he was teaching. Jesus decided that he had had enough of those people and he walked away from the crowd. I think if someone asked me to give a lesson and then they got angry because of what I was teaching, I'd have to walk away too. Even though Jesus had a bad day and decided to walk away from the crowd, Jesus didn't quit teaching about God for forever. Just like how we don't quit things for forever when they become difficult. Jesus didn't quit teaching people about God's love. And because Jesus didn't stop teaching others about God, we get to learn about Jesus and God today. And because we get to learn about Jesus and God, we can also learn about how to share God's love, even when things are difficult, just like Jesus did. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Please help us share about your love, even when it's difficult. Amen. Luke 4, 21 through 30. Then he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself, and you will say, Do you hear also in your hometown the things that have heard you did at Capernaum? And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land, yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many leopards in Israel at the time of the prophet Elijah, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Let us pray. May these words on my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. We often preach the scripture as one whole sermon. We don't really separate it out because it seems like a whole story. However, in Luke's account, we've done this. Last week, we left off from Jesus preaching and everyone seemed amazed by it. And I think they were in awe that they were getting to participate in the scriptures being fulfilled. As we left off from last week, Jesus was the center of the stage amidst an admiring congregation. He was reading this beautiful passage from the prophet Isaiah about good news for the poor, freedom for the prisoner, and sight for the blind, and justice for the oppressed. Every eye in the synagogue was fixed on him. Only being impressed by his gracious words and his authoritative bearing. So we have to ask in this week's scripture, what goes wrong? In this part of the scripture, it starts off that they are amazed. You can almost picture it. Them talking about, wasn't this Joseph's boy? The carpenter's kid with the iffy birth story? Who would have thought he'd grow up to become a healer, a preacher, a miracle worker? Their very own rising star in their hometown. And then we often skip to why his words weren't accepted. We skip to the end about how he was rejected in his hometown. What did Jesus do that was so wrong? 
Why would his own hometown reject him? It seems insane. So where does it go wrong? Where do we see the scripture going wrong? Have you seen those memes where they talk about no one and no big blank? And then there's some other comment. For example, like, no one, Egyptians, want pyramids? The joke is really about how no one said anything or asked for whatever information is to follow up. The thought is unprovoked. Because when you read the scripture, that almost seems to be the case. Otherwise, we could say hometown, nothing. And then Jesus, actually, I'm not going to come in here and heal you all. I'm not here to perform miracles. Obviously, this is one way to paraphrase it. Because perhaps we weren't privy to the questions he got asked before the service or maybe during passing of the peace. Hey, Jesus, I have a great aunt who could really use some help on that hurt hip. It'll just take a minute. And of course, those requests could have piled up. And so maybe that's why Jesus is responding that way. We really don't know. But everything seems to turn and go wrong when Jesus essentially says, I'm not yours. I don't belong to you. I am not yours to claim or contain. He does this by citing God's long history of prioritizing the outsider. Remember, we talked about how Luke really emphasizes this in his scriptures. Elijah was sent to care for the widow at Zarephath. He reminds him. And then Jesus goes on to say he wasn't sent to the widows of Israel. Elijah was instructed to heal Naaman the Syrian, not the numerous lepers in Israel. And as one commentary puts it, in other words, God has always been in the business of working on the margins, of doing new and exciting things in remote and unlikely places, far from home, far from the familiar and the comfortable, far from the centers of power and piety. I imagine this is all very upsetting to hear. If we think of it in the point of the townspeople, we might understand the passage reaction better. Who knows how long they've been waiting to welcome Jesus home, to see for themselves the wonders that they've been hearing about through the grapevine. At this point, they've heard about Jesus opening up the heavens in his presence and how he turned water into that really good wine. And then, of course, diseases that disappeared and demons that scattered to oblivion. Surely, they must have thought, if their, if their hometown hero was willing to peddle miracles to perfect strangers out there, when he came back home, he'd do a hundredfold back here. He would do it for his kin, his insiders, his chosen people. And of course, this was not the case. And Jesus makes it very clear to them that this was not the purpose of his visit. When's a time that you heard Jesus tell you to do something and yet you didn't do it? You did not respond. Think about it for a minute. Is that not the equivalent of trying to push Jesus off a cliff? When have we been guilty of this? We can use our biblical imagination to say that Jesus' response about healing was uncalled for. But the actions following were even more so uncalled for. We may not always like what we hear or what others do, but that never gives us permission to automatically want to throw someone off a cliff. Sure, we've all had moments that we felt like we've been pushed to the edge, but that's not how Jesus wants us to treat one another. Sometimes we do find ourselves acting like Jesus here, we jump to assumptions. We assume we understand others and their desires or their secret agendas, when in truth we make assumptions and we fill in the missing information. Have you ever been upset with a friend and you're thinking they aren't responding to me the way that I think they should, or you've texted them, or conversations just seem off? And instead of confronting them about it, we hold it in. When we hold on our own emotions as being the truth, we often find ourselves hanging off a cliff. 
Sometimes we're tasked with the most difficult thing ever, and that's to have the conversation. It's to take the time to get at the root of what's going on. Maybe there's other things going on with our friends, and it's really nothing to do with us. But we've held in all this tension that we've created, and it's not there. And so we think about other times, maybe that we've allowed the truth to not be the truth. What's a time that you maybe thought of yourself in a better light? Um, a new show that Chase and I just adore and love is Guy's Chance of a Lifetime. It's actually not like the other competitions that you see on TV all the time. This is actually these like um, six individuals that are going through an intense job interview and we're all witnessing it. At the end of the series, the plan is that he will give one of those um, people a new restaurant franchise with him. And so in it, they had teams this last time that we watched. And when they were competing, one of the competitors, Chelsea, did not do so well. So far in this um, interview, she's been top of the class. She's been flying through a lot of things. And she just did not perform well. And when she was hearing back feedback, she kept going on about how she couldn't believe her idol would tell her these things and how she can't be for sure that she can really see him as an idol anymore because he said that her performance that day was a two out of 10. And then in her interviews where she's kind of giving her commentary, she keeps saying, I am not a two. I have never been called a two in my life. I am always at the top. And so she could not get over it. And sometimes we have those moments, right? Where we find ourselves having an idea, a picture of who we are or who others are. And so when that image becomes cluttered and it's not quite what we thought, it's really hard because we've entered into a time that that truth is no longer the truth. You see, Barbara Brown Taylor, she writes this as disillusionment. She says, even though it stings, it's essential to the Christian life. She describes disillusionment as literally the loss of an illusion about ourselves, about the world, about God. And while it's almost a painful thing, it's never a bad thing. We lose the lies that we have mistaken for the truth. Did you hear that? We have lost the lies that we have mistaken for the truth. So what are some lies that you have claimed as truth? Maybe they're lies that are positive, but sometimes maybe they're even the negative. Believing that you're not good enough, not worth it. Or maybe thinking that you have no room for growth and that you're a perfect Christian. Let's pop that bubble because we know that we all have work to do. And that's what Luke's story this week is calling us to do. It calls us into the sense of losing who we are and leaving home so we can go and find Jesus. You guys hear me all the time quote Debbie Thomas because I just love her work with scriptures. And so she writes this about the scripture this week. So I wonder, how do I refuse to let others in my life grow and change? When do I box in their identities that are narrow and constricting? Where in my life do I try to kill the new and unfamiliar instead of leaning into the newness of curiosity and delight? Do I allow the people I am close to to become? Do I allow myself that same opportunity? Or do I cut others off with expectations that none of us can bear? You will always be small, weak, broken, insufficient, disappointing. You will never outgrow your family, your background, your race, upbringing, wounds, addictions. You must always be recognizable, accommodating, domesticated mind. It's time to get uncomfortable. 
it's time for us to allow those moments that those lies are shed and to live out a new truth. We all know that movie quote, you can't handle the truth. And honestly, sometimes we can't. We don't want to. We want to live in the state of illusions that we have created. After all, those are safe. Those are comfortable. But they are not true. So it's time for us to face the truth. And it could be painful but it also invites in an adventure. So as we prepare for an adventure, we feel a lot of things, right? We can feel scared, we can be elated, we can be curious, and sometimes we'll create so many scenarios of things that may or may not happen. But when we trust God and accept that invitation, we will grow in leaps and bounds in our faith but also in the truth. And so let us not be held back anymore because God is on the move and so should we. So let's get going. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. the truth. That is not true. With God, you can handle anything because God will be there to carry you through it all. May you go through this week as you explore those lies and discover new truths, and may you share the love of God with all that you meet. Amen. Amen.